Heading into Hell in a Cell, I was a little concerned about the fact there were only five matches on the card, and three of them were Hell in a Cell matches. Like, it made me worry a little bit about flow of the show, you know, the length of those matches. But then, I gotta remember who our tribal chief is, and by God, he values your time. Doesn't he? And when you think about WWE, especially in the past decade, I know at least for me, one of my biggest, most sizable, consistent concerns about this company and its product is their lack of ability, their lack of desire to tell good stories. Professional wrestling, as much as everything else, it's action, it's suspense, it's drama, it's comedy, it's horror, it's everything. At the end of the day, when you get down to brass tacks, it fundamentally is about telling stories. And if you're looking for a reason as to why would I still watch professional wrestling? Why do I put up with professional wrestling after all of these years? Why do I still give WWE a chance after all of those years? And certainly at times, no question indeed, you look at Hell in a Cell, and you look at Jey Uso versus Roman Reigns as just one example as to why. Because, my God, ugh, was this spectacular. If you thought their match at Clash of Champions was really good, then this match at Hell in a Cell took it to a whole different level. And... The storytelling is just an aid. It's natural here, but they do a fantastic job with this. Like, the way Roman Reigns continues to portray just how truly torn he is and conveys that messaging so easily and effectively to the audience, how pained he is and what he has no choice but to do. He's been given no other alternative. Jay turned heel on him. Jay turned heel on the family. Jimmy also turned heel on him and turned heel on the family. It's Roman that's the tribal chief. It's Roman that has all the pressure and the burden of expectations and responsibilities for the family. He's the one that got pushed to this brink. He even gave warnings. He said, you don't want to go here. He let him know. He let him know. And just like family is prone to do, they just don't want to damn listen. So at some point in time, Roman has to lay down the law. And you could just feel it in this match. The passion that was there. The brotherhood that was there. The love that was there. Every time that a strap shot was unleashed, you could feel it. I even love how Jey Uso was evoking the emotions and profanity as he was lashing out against Roman. Now just imagine, like there's only one moment that makes you kind of question things a little bit. Is when the ref is asking at any point in time in this match if Roman was going to quit. Really? You must not know our tribal chief very well. But this was truly spectacular. And this is a perfect example of how you can take something easy and make it really work. It is a perfect example how you don't always need spots to get people over. It is how you can have a great match without everybody having to kill each other. Sure, there's physicality, some brutality. There are physical aspects to the match, but that's not what it's about. Instead of the match being about the spots and the bumps, it's the spots and the bumps that play a part in telling the larger story and narrative of the match, and that's what we want more. <laughs> and you could even feel it as you got close to the end of the match, and Jay refusing to quit, no matter what Roman was doing to him. Like, that's the type of stuff that makes a star. And even with Roman getting ready to do what he doesn't want to do, but he has no choice, he has to do, because it is the overwhelming burden and responsibility of being the tribal chief, even when he's getting ready to throw the steps in. Now, some of you are going to talk about that bunch of mania, and shame on you. It was clearly an attempt by Roman to warn everybody in the ring, hey, I'm going to be throwing these stairs in. This is a warning. Next one, it's coming over the top ropes. Please dis disperse in order to allow there be to be room to fall for the stairs and nobody to get hurt. It was just fantastic. And even some of you had talked about it, and I know I thought about it too, like how's this finish going to work? Probably makes more sense for Jake 
to you know begin his ass kick, but that's not enough. And then Jimmy comes in, and it's actually Roman starts effing with Jimmy, and that leads to Jay quitting. Like again, playing off the family stuff, and you could feel the emotions of the moment. Like Jimmy and Roman, the dialogue that they had. Like Roman is trying to make millions and millions for the family in the future, showing off his acting chops that a lot of you foolishly, naively, myself included, how dare I not think that Roman Reigns actually had. Like the only concern about this match, frankly, in a clear to me match of the year candidate, unless you're one of those nuts or marks, that believes in the moves and the matches and just all the spots is what makes great wrestling. This, this is what makes great wrestling. The concern to me was, why the hell did you open the show with this? Now, obviously, it's because Roman knew that you probably had a lot of people that wanted to watch the World Series or they wanted to watch the Seahawks-Cardinals game on Sunday night. So even in this high-pressure moment, this spot in time, here's Roman Reigns thinking about you, you, you! All of you. And... It's a thankless job. But our tribal chief, he does it so, so, so well. That's one of the best opening matches to a pay-per-view that I have ever, ever seen. It was just fantastic. And I felt really bad for Elias and Jeff Hardy having to follow this. Because nothing could. Realistically. They did the best they could. They had an okay little match for the time that they had, but... You know, Elias wins, but did anybody really care? No. You know, then you got to the Miz versus Otis. At stake was a Money in the Bank contract. You know, as the match was being set up, like you could maybe get a sense that something was going to happen here. And then once John Morrison got kicked out, you're like, oh. And at least I know I was on Twitter saying, oh, is Tucker going to turn here? No. And he did. But it works. I guess time. Tucker and Otis are going to be on separate shows. So there's no reason for them to have to be buddy-buddy anymore. And especially when you're looking at you wanting to give Tucker a purpose. You're wanting to give him a reason for being and being around. Like, here's a reason for that. And a lot of what Tucker said post-match, after he had made the turn and he was getting interviewed, a lot of it made sense. Like... Some of the best heel turns are the ones that are the most logical because at least you can believe in the reason that this person would be mad. It's a careful balance, though, because if you're not careful, they end up becoming big baby faces in the whole situation. Uh, but this worked. And Miz holding the Money in the Bank briefcase makes infinitely more sense than Otis doing it, frankly. Uh, the only concern that really came out of the Miz winning this match and becoming the new Money in the Bank contract holder was I felt like it kind of put a cloud over the rest of the show um, because in some ways you were waiting for him to cash in on Orton or McIntyre. And especially once you found out that the next match was going to be Sasha Banks versus Bayley in Hell in a Cell, and they weren't. They weren't going to be main eventing, even though you could probably make an argument that their story commanded it or demanded it. That's where you really started to think that maybe Miz was going to cash in. Um, but Sasha Banks and Bayley. I haven't, been, I haven't been huge on this story. I've talked about that before on this channel. I think it's taken way too long to get here. But I will give these two ladies this. Is that when you put them in this spot, like they can really, really deliver the goods. Now, still, unfortunately for them, they have to follow up to the tribal chief and Jey Uso's Hell in a Cell match. And who's going to do that? But... They did a really, really damn good job. This match was outstanding in its own right. Like I talked about heading into the show that this was a one-match show for me because it was all about the Universal title, Hell in a Cell match. But the, the filler stuff didn't matter as much. It came down to those three Hell in a Cell matches. And that was going to get, give you a gauge of how much you enjoyed the show or didn't enjoy the show, how good the show was or not good the show was. And this one certainly, certainly delivered. Again, the spots and the intensity played off of the story, played off of the heat between the two. It didn't sit there and just always feel like it's spots for the sake of spots. Like, this match was really, really well done. And the fact that they had Sasha Banks win the belt here in Hell in a Cell, isn't that like her first Hell in a Cell match victory? Like, it worked. It absolutely worked. And in some ways, especially when you look at what happened at the end of the night, 
It feels like if you were going to insist on putting Jay and Roman first because Roman is thinking about all of you, then at least give Bailey and Sasha the chance to main event this show. Because this was certainly, to me, easily the second best Hell in a Cell match of the night. Nothing was going to follow the opening, granted, but uh, this would have been best served coming on at the end. But it didn't. But now the question comes to Sasha Banks, as it always is, is she actually going to successfully defend her damn title? It's not about whether or not she can win belts. It's about whether or not she can keep them. And even then, I still come back to the fundamental problem with this whole thing of it took way too long to get to this turn. Bailey's more natural in her role here than Sasha Banks really is in her role here. Sasha Banks is looking fire as hell, I must say, in her white ring gear. But at the end of the day, they've done so much to not make us care about Sasha Banks over the past few years with how they have booked her, especially as champion. Why all of a sudden would we care now? That's all I'm saying. Uh, speaking of why in the hell would we care, re re this retribution thing is beyond buried. It's beyond stupid. So the Hurt business is going to face somebody from Retribution. Bobby Lashley is going to be the guy to answer the call for the Hurt business. And he's putting the United States Championship on the line. So you bring out Slap Jack or Slap Ass or whatever the hell his name is. And Bobby Lashley submits him in less than four minutes. And even if you try to get Retribution out there, Bobby Lashley is basically going to work through them all like, what the hell is this supposed to be about? Why the hell would anybody take this seriously? Think about you clowns that were sitting there and saying, this is a big spotlight and a big opportunity and a big chance for Ali, Jeff, and Shred You don't even know what the hell you're talking about. I would like to take this time right now to formally request my complete and official apology because you have nothing. They finally get a pay-per-view match and they lose in less than four minutes. They finally get a pay-per-view match, and even then it's unannounced, and even then, they get less than four minutes. They've been made to look stupid at the pass at every opportunity that Vince and WWE have had. Again, this is one of these things, one of these ideas that shows up someday in a Death of WWE Blu-ray set, and you know I'm damn right here. It's ridiculous. And then we get to the main event. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, still shame on you. Beat me three times, nah. <laughs> Breakfast club business, bitch! Randy Orton, Drew McIntyre, Hell in a Cell for the WWE Championship. Like, I, I'd be honest. I probably would have enjoyed this match a little bit more, A, if it was about 10 minutes shorter, I understand why this one went long, but he already had two longer Hell in a Cell matches that involved two long-running stories or two interesting stories, potentially. Like, now you get to the third one, it's a little bit much. It did not feel like this match was at a level where it deserved to be the main event, and especially what happened earlier on in the night with Miz becoming the Money in the Bank contract holder. This is where you're thinking, okay, now they're going to main event this, so this means Miz is going to have to cash in, right? And then that didn't happen. Like, it felt like... Once Miz won that contract, that's what I was waiting for, was to have him cash in. And then when it didn't happen, like, this main event just kind of felt like a thud. I mean, it was good in terms of a Hell in a Cell match, but again, it was kind of the thing of Drew already beat him once at a pay-per-view, then he beat him again at a pay-per-view, and now this time, in the stipulation that in theory should technically favor the babyface, or you typically would structure for the babyface to go over, now you're having the heel Orton win? Like, that's a little bit surprising to me. You know, also appropriate, though, because if you think of the Breakfast Club, that buys you multiple opportunities that other folks just don't have. So now you've got Randy Orton is a 10-time, 10-time WWE champion, a 14-time world champion, which ties him with a certain higher power, Ugga. And, and, and I got to say this. Randall, you've delivered on your part. Now, certainly there are going to be fans that are hyping up and talking about when Edge comes back and they're going to face off for the title at WrestleMania. Yeah, 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 yeah. Been there, done that. Who cares? There are only two potential matches here. Only two potential matches here. It is not Edge. One, it's Triple H because now God should be pissed that Randy Orton has dared to have the gall and the balls to tie him for 14 world championships in WWE. That in and of itself is reason to battle. 
But I just want to call this out. John! Oh, Jonathan! In case you didn't see, Randall Keith Orton is the new WWE Championship. And certainly you don't envision this title reign to last a night or two. Well, I sit there and say this, and then they're going to have the Miz cash in on him on Raw Monday night. History repeating itself again 10 years later, huh? But he's probably going to be looking for somebody to work with at WrestleMania. You're going to be looking for something to do, I have a feeling, right around WrestleMania season. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but man, that sure sounds good. John Cena takes on Randall Keith Orton for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania 10,000 times before, but this one counts! Like, don't you dare dick tease me, WWE. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. You've got the belt on Orton now. Half of what I need is there. Give me the other half. Give me the other half. Make me complete. Make me whole. And ignore what these other people emote outwardly, verbally, with your flaming feet, keyboard fingers of fire. It's insignificant. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they all know deep down and they cackle from their heart and soul that they want it too. That's the only redeeming quality for this. Is it gets me halfway to the other dream matchup at WrestleMania. Think about a WrestleMania that's built around The Rock versus Roman Reigns and John Cena versus Randy Orton. And maybe Brock Lesnar versus Drew McIntyre. Now you're talking about a WrestleMania that feels big, aren't you? That's what I'm saying. Uh, but for me, admittedly, you know, I wasn't going to find a whole lot to complain about with this show. Once that open year happened, like, that was it. Like, everything else was copacetic. It was gravy, smooth, no lumps after Jay versus Roman. Like, that, that is professional wrestling. That's why we still refuse to let go of WWE fully. That's why, after all these years, after all the crap that people say to us in our lives on a daily basis, this is why we put up with it. Because when we see it, we know it. And shame on those that deny themselves the honor to feel it. Because you could feel it on Sunday night. And as much as Orton tried... What a tricky, tricky viper he is. We still got all this crap in in about three hours or so, ending it right around 10 Eastern. Bam, smack, boom. Thank you, Roman. Thank you, Roman. It was a lot of fun Sunday night. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Now smash that subscribe button and tell everybody to watch this review.